Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. Hello, and welcome to Growth Insights Podcast. I'm so happy to welcome back Mary Ellen Lynch, Principal Center Store Solutions here at IRI, to talk about private label. We've had a few episodes this year about private brands, but this one seems especially timely because we're experiencing very high inflation. Uh, Inflation was 8.5% in July, which was down a little bit from 9.1% in June. And some people consider that relief, but I think the hard fact is that inflation is 11% in CPG and it stings. Um, I've asked Mary Ellen to talk with me because typically there's when there's high inflation, and specifically I'm thinking of the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, people turn to private label as a cost savings measure. measure. So Mary Ellen, welcome. And would you say that, is that the case now? Are people buying private label as a cost savings measure? Well, first off, hello, Joan. Good to be with you again. <laughs> Um, I would say that consumers are applying a variety of strategies to how they shop, but let's just consider for a moment this interesting fact. If you ask the consumer how the economy is doing, they will say terrible. If you ask them how they personally are doing, they would say, "Um, you know, I'm okay, but I feel bad for the other guy. So, That's a little bit different than 2008 and 2009, where there was record high unemployment and um, just a a myriad of things going on. This is a different combination of things that are occurring. And so, yes, people still have to live within a certain budget. And so they are making trade-offs. But they're not trading off to private label the way they did in the Great Recession. Is that what you're saying? Correct. All okay. right. And in fact, you know, what we've seen across the store in, in so many departments is that volume is down, whether or not it's private brand or name brand. Um, so are you seeing that people are just consuming a little bit less overall? And that's true. Exactly, Joan. People are, if you look at volume, so you're going to see a lot of statistics in the press around dollars. Dollars are up, sales are up. That's based on dollars. And of course, they're up because prices are up. But if you want to really understand consumer demand, you need to look at volume. And people are buying less volume of both store brands and name brands. And again, as I was saying earlier, this is to meet their grocery budget constraints. You know, they have to live within a certain, you know, framework of their budget and they'll buy less. They're holding off buying that extra for the pantry. They're holding off buying and looking for a better price elsewhere. They'll hold off buying to reduce food waste. And they'll hold off on buying more discretionary type items. You know, they're they're being more conscious about what they're purchasing and thinking, do I really need this? Got it. So we issued, IRI issued a press release recently, which is available on our website, iriworldwide.com, that really talked a lot about inflation. And there was a a snippet in there on private label, and the private label was growing in certain categories. So can you speak to where private label is growing? Indeed, it is quite definitely growing in high inflationary categories, your meat, dairy, eggs, oil, some of the more single ingredient type categories. And in fact, those categories drove about 50% of the grocery price inflation. And this is, again, where the consumers leaned in more to store brands. Um, And also, these are the categories where products are less differentiated. I was just thinking that when you were talking about so many of those dairy categories, that seems to be very heavy um, private label anyway, right? Correct. 
Yeah. And, you know, now that you're even mentioning it, okay, those single, when you say single ingredient, I think baking aisle. And again, that would be a go-to, you know, where the, you don't really see that much difference in some of those items like flour or sugar or baking soda. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. Still looking at private label. And again, I can't quite get that whole recession thing out of my head. Are there other categories, maybe more multi-ingredient categories where private label is doing well? There are. There are a few. And in fact, uh, one that's a little bit of a surprise is frozen snacks. And the reason it's surprising is because in general, the snack companies, the big brands, they invest a lot in building brand awareness and engaging the consumer and drawing them into their brands. And so seeing snacks um, in frozen kind of break out as um, a growth area is a little surprising. And then secondarily, we're seeing refrigerated spreads. And keep in mind, this also includes hummus, which is you know still continuing to grow itself. And so when I think about these two categories, frozen snacks, and then also the refrigerated spreads, they s- seem to me to both align with on-premise family dining, like the grazer appetizer menu. And so maybe it's a case where these are things, um, you know, to re kind of revisit that kind of experience at home, or maybe it's just a case that, you know, consumers are snacking more at home. You know, I I have a fun example too, um, that I've seen are like pretzel bites in kind of a party tray um, for private brand. And it's like, that is pretty interesting. That, That kind of hits exactly where you're saying it's like that restaurant experience, but at home. So yeah, that's, that's a really interesting take. So that frozen appetizer or frozen, yeah, frozen appetizer, frozen snacks, that kind of does speak to more like group or entertaining. And I think that takes me back to your comment about volume and how volume was the better way, not just sales dollars or not unit sales, but that was a better way of looking at things. So are these particularly with frozen snacks, is that more about like a better volume deal? It's going to differ by category and by product and nature of product. You know, right now it sometimes feels like the wild west of price changes out there with manufacturing taking manufacturers taking price at different times, as well as retailers executing price changes at different times. And the consumer who shops multiple stores has been seeing this in action. And so it could have been because of size, or it could have been for convenience, because we know there's some little three pack type frozen snack things out there as well. But what is important because of this dynamic right now with pricing and size of product is volume should be the focus. Volume will reflect consumer demand and looking at dollars mass demand truth. And it's important to understand like how much is selling, not just how many, not just based on how many dollars Um, pass through the register. You are really hitting a nerve there. And um, I want to talk a little bit more about this because what we're also seeing and what the shopper is definitely seeing is shrinkflation where package size might go down um, and volume go down with it. Or it might be that the package looks the same, but the volume is down. Um, So I want to, you know, talk a little bit more about that is like private label, would that be an antidote to some of that shrinkflation that we're seeing with name brands? Not necessarily because they're affected by those actions taken by the brand and store brand wants its margins too, right? And changing volume or anything means extra cost um, for the new packaging um, or count within the package or whatever they change related to the package. And these changes in packaging size and counts and volumes can roll out rapidly by the name brands, less so by the store brands, because their manufacturers basically have to keep switching out labels and packaging and do new design for that store brand, possibly. And so it's a little less agile. And really, it's really important for the store brands to pay attention to that price pack architecture that's emerging on shelf. And be agile and responsive to what the name brand companies are doing. Um, 
I can totally see how that would be something that store brands couldn't necessarily keep up with, but maybe that's an on-shelf promotion right there just to say, look, our, our volume or our size, our pack size hasn't changed. Theirs has, um, you know, almost look, take a look at the volume that you're getting. But that's just, that's exactly right, Joan. And the bottom line is the store brand on the shelf relative to the changes the name brands make in our executing needs to make sense with the consumer. And the consumer doesn't want to be surprised when they get the product home and realize, you know, it has only, you know, it's only an eight count and not a 10 count like it used to be. Mm -hmm. And so there is opportunity there, but it definitely there's a lot of evolution happening at shelf. Yeah, that's so interesting. I just talked to Ray Florio and he mentioned that exact same thing where, you know, a, a product might change the number of servings um, you know, he used the example of hot dogs going from a really big jumbo hot dog to a smaller hot dog, and, you know, a normal size hot dog, but maybe adding another one in the pack to really satisfy the consumer. So the consumer feels like they're getting more. So I completely get that. Um, you know, our that inflation press release that I mentioned also talked about consumers trading down to trade up. And I know so many um, retailers have different private label programs that come in tiers. So some of the, some products might be premium, some might be same as national brand. So can you tell if it, tell us if there's like movement toward or away from some of those products in tiers? Well, we're seeing some movement into premium and specialty, but in reality, about 80% of store brands are national brand equivalent type products. Um, there is additional opportunity for growth in the more premium and kind of eclectic product if the product really does have the benefits of premium. And that means, is it better than, and can I trust the store brand to provide that premium experience given it is priced less than the premium brand? Also, you know, the premium success must be analyzed by the rate retailer within the context of its store brands. And again, yes, we're seeing some success in those premium stores. Yeah, but um, but here's where I'd like to bring up a case of um, we didn't really talk about this earlier, Joan. But the refrigerated pizza at Aldi and refrigerated pizzas overall, the store brands have been growing like crazy during um, this time, inflationary time. And one thing that I found interesting is another hot item at Aldi is their 95 cent pizza dough, and that's not really actually premium, but what it does is it provides a foundation for that consumer to interpret their own interpretation or premiumization, right? And so you can see a lot of chatter online about how people have used this refrigerated dough and used other products to make it from Aldi to make it premium, like oh. uh, burnt ends and a particular sauce or adding my own vegetables and this other premium cheese. And so they're actually using that as a foundation. So premiumization um, can take different forms. Right. And you know what, that's, I say that all the time about value, like value isn't all about price. So you're absolutely right to call that out. It's, it's the perception of the shopper with um, what it is they're purchasing. And in this case, it might be more of an experience, you know, because that is half the fun is building your own pizza. So I get that. Um, so I love that Aldi example. Can we talk about um, some retailers that are um, that do do private brands well? Um, you know, I mean, you and I have talked in the past about Aldi fans and their Isle of Shame or their Aldi nerd groups and stuff. But what other retailers do you really look at um, as hitting the mark with private brands? Well, different retailers deploy different strategies for different purposes. For example, Aldi's clearly trying to clear some inventory with their red tag sale. Something Aldi, you typically won't see a red tag type sale at Aldi, but they're moving a lot of product right now. <laughs> Which definitely speaks to our inflationary period. So yay. Yay. And Another example is Wegmans. Wegmans has a strategy of high quality, great price store brands. And they're known for their quality of these store brands. Um, it gets the shopper into the store and then they lure the shopper into 
you know, price your prepared foods and specialty items, which they are also known for. And the shopper can feel good about um, buying those items because they saved on the basics. It's a different kind of strategy than Aldi. And then another one would be HEB, which it's a destination as well because of their breadth of assortment for their store brands and the quality of those brands and how eclectic some of those store brands are. That's so cool. And, you know, I always love Target because Target has so many different store brands all across the the store that I I would guess a lot of consumers don't even realize are store brands. Um, very cool. Very different to your point, very different purposes. And I like that Wegmans example because that goes back to almost like not necessarily trading down, but feeling comfortable with spending a little bit more for a different type of product. You know, I'm saving money on this nice store brand, but so I can afford that prepared meal, for example. Exactly. It comes back to the putting the consumer or shopper at the center and the psychology and the needs of that consumer. So in in kind of wrapping up, Mary Ellen, a couple of the things that I'm hearing from you is that private brands are doing well, but in the categories where they've typically done well, and that programs have become so much more sophisticated and different retailers have their own approaches to um, private brands. You know, to your point, I think you mentioned that 80% of private brands are um, national brand equivalent. So not necessarily that low entry point or that premium product, but, you know, kind of on par with those um, name brands. But at the same time, um, you know, they've all got different strategies, whether it's really helping people stick to a tight budget or making people feel comfortable about maybe spending up in some categories. Did I miss anything? Is there something else that you'd like to add? No, I think that's exactly right. And again, it comes back to the strategy for that particular retailer, the overall strategy for store brands, and then how that strategy is executed on shelf within different categories. And different categories will have different strategies. One, some categories will require that lowest price anchor and other categories won't. And some categories, um, it's relevant to have the premiumization of items in that set. And in some categories, it's not. So it's multi-tiered and and then, of course, execution, right? Yep, which is a completely different conversation um, because until retailers start treating their store brands as name brands and giving them the support they need, um, maybe we won't see that big dive towards store brands that we saw in the recession. And I'll still be here scratching my head. <laughs> well, one last point, too. It's, you know, during the last recession, so that 2008, 9, into 2012, Remember, some of these retailers were building their store brands and really executing on them. So they've already had success in their store brands. So how much more can they gain incrementally during this time when many consumers are already aware of them and may already have them in their acceptable set? Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the question. Yep. Yep. And, you know, it's funny because just that strategy that you just described of what happened in the Great Recession throughout the pandemic, it's been all about e-commerce. So again, I want to go back to that whole marketing and it's like you can use your e-commerce platform to promote your products first. Um, and I think even talk up the, you know, the inflationary factors that might make your store brands um, the viable choice. So with that, Mary Ellen, thank you again. Always such a pleasure. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insight. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.
Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. Hello, and welcome to another episode of IRI Growth Insights. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Ray Florio, a partner in IRI's growth consulting practice. Ray is a go-to here at IRI for insights and strategies on pricing, revenue management, value proposition, and portfolio and brand strategy. Ray is all about growth and profitability, even in tough economic times. So he's the right person to talk about inflation. And I can guarantee that Ray has been talking a lot about inflation with IRI clients. He recently published a blog on creating opportunity in an inflationary environment, and you can find that at iriworldwide.com. So welcome, Ray. Thank you, Joe. Um, so we're not economists here at IRI, um, but like many in the industry, including economists, we've been talking about the topic of a recession, we've been tracking inflation, and we're seeing the impact of inflation on both consumers and businesses. So despite like the guessing game of whether or not we're in a recession, the important thing is that we both, that we feel and we're behaving like we're in a recession. So with that, we agree that it feels like a recession. What does that look like from the manufacturer or retailer lens? Uh, Joan, I think uh, if you're a traditional CPG manufacturer or retailer, you go with the mindset that, you know, recession might not be that bad for me. And the reason why is essentially people still need to eat. You think about it. I mean, if you're in a tough economic time, what are the things you cut back on first? It's probably when you go out to eat, it's probably your vacation. It really isn't your local trip to the grocery store. But I don't know if right now that's the best way to look at things. And the reason for that is we have actually have seen lengthier recessions happen. I mean, everyone thinks about the Great Recession. I mean, that's the first and foremost in everyone's mind. And we've actually been spoiled. Aside from that, the average recession since World War II has only been about 11 months. And typically, you see a trend where you start cutting back on the things that you go out for. Like, I'm not going to get that cup of coffee at the local cafe. I'm going to go out to eat less. I'm not going to go to the movies as much. All things like that that honestly sound like a wonderful... uh, return to normalcy after we've spent two years locked indoors. But the problem is, after six to nine months of cutting back like that, we actually tend to see the transition happen. People start looking more judiciously at what they spend in the grocery store. Now, you can say, yeah, but uh, the good news is, if we're in a recession, we're only six months in. That probably is not the best way to look at things either. And why I say that is, just think about it, Joan, if you cut it back to its basics, what really is it that a recession causes? It's basically, if I'm a shopper in the store, each dollar feels much more dear to me, and I need to make more thoughtful trade-offs in how I use it. I'm going to think a lot more about each purchase. That essential behavior has been ingrained for well over a year at this point due to the inflationary cycle that we've been in. We've already seen shoppers actually changing their behavior at the grocery store. I think essentially what we're seeing right now is not only the fact that these recessionary behaviors have taken effect over the past quarter of the past half year, but 
we're actually well past the time that we're going to see these behaviors become more ingrained. It's not a short-term thing. Right. You know, we had um, last year, we had so much stimulus and people were still kind of reeling from quarantines and stuff. So it was kind of, you know, as as the pandemic ebbed and flowed, people were spending a lot more. They were buying a lot of premium items, making that at-home experience so much richer. But to your point, we are seeing what we would consider recessionary um, shopping behaviors. And people are starting to trade down or they're looking for deals. And frankly, you know, promotions have not really rebounded that I've seen. Maybe you've seen something different. Um, but we're seeing people shop more value retailers, dollar stores, Walmart. Um, so what do you think that this recessionary behavior means for bottom line for CPGers? So bottom line is a good term to use because that's what everyone's focused on right now. You think about it, there's a lot of offsetting behaviors that we see the manufacturers and retailers taking. And those will come into the form of, hey, I'll take my prices up, or maybe, you know what, I can find some additional efficiencies in my manufacturing process. You know, we really blew out our portfolio during the pandemic. Now we can trim back to something that is more cost effective on the logistics side and everything like that. But all of that may translate into maybe five to 10% recovery of the margin that we're taking from increasing costs. Well, if you're in a world where inflation is over 9%, that wipes out the gain within a year. The other problem is inflation is very unlikely to go away anytime soon. So how do you actually combat that for the next year and the next year? And why I say it's not going away, I think we often look back at the Great Recession. I mean, OK, that's an outlier because it lasted 18 months. But does anybody ever look back and think about the great inflation? That happened in the 70s and early 80s. You didn't talk about a year and a half of an extended economic cycle. This was over a decade and it spanned three individual recessions at that point. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say right here that uh, we're going to have 10 to 13 years of inflation that we're going to face right now. But it is not out of the realm of possibility to say that we have another two years or so before things get back to normal at the very least. OK, that's um, first of all, I want to say thank you for not thinking that we're going to have a 10 year um, recession, but even two to three years, you know. That is striking to me. Is it going to feel more like the Great Recession? Because even though we were out of it, technically, it felt like it lasted a lot longer than it did. Um, is that kind of what you're inferring here? Yeah, I don't know if the recession itself is going to be that long lasting. I think the inflationary period that we're facing right now is what's going to be much longer lasting that we have to take uh, and deal with. Okay. And the reason for that is a lot of it comes down to right now, there's a fairly big supply and demand imbalance, and it's focused on the core commodities, food and fuel. Once again, things that people really can't live without. And until the supply catches up, we're going to have this type of dynamic that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's almost a little bit morbid to say it, but back in the great inflationary period, one of the things that actually helped over time was there was enough time for the birth rate to go down to decrease the demand. Now, I don't think things will get as bad this time, but we do have to be prepared to go for the long haul. Well, I, I think that Again, you know, that whole birth rate thing is is a completely almost another topic that we could spend 20 minutes yes. on because it's pretty low. And I would have we I would have anticipated a baby boom from the pandemic. That didn't necessarily happen. I, I happen to think um, things might be coming back anyway. But OK, so let's get back to the inflation. And you had mentioned like, you know, this margin erosion, you know, and companies kind of 
trying to play the short game, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, But let's talk a little bit about what it's going to take to kind of retain the valuable shoppers. You know, um, again, we're talking about the bottom line, but at the same time, it's so important for the long term to keep those valuable shoppers coming back. So what what are you recommending there? So there is some good news amongst all of this. There is still very much the opportunity not just to retain those valuable shoppers, but do so while you're also achieving profitable growth. And it's happened before during periods like this. The whole key to it, though, is that you can't just look at raising prices or getting those manufacturing efficiencies. You have to almost think of it as what's going on over different time horizons that I can impact, knowing that this is going to be a bit long lasting. So there's what I can do short term within the next year. There's what I can do in the midterm of the next one to two years, and then longer term, more than two years out. And the expectation is basically you need to keep making progress through all three of those periods, because if you continue along that lines, you're not just building your value proposition, but you're building future pricing leverage so that when you need to make offsetting price increases, you have the ability to do so. Okay, so we already talked about the margin crunch. So what's like let's let's talk about the short term because everyone wants something that they can act on right away. So let's start with that short term and dig into that a little bit. Absolutely. And if you're thinking short term, the key thing you need to keep in mind is that this is what you can do today. It means your existing offering set, and it means no lengthy or costly investment as well. So first and foremost, we've talked about retailers and manufacturers taking price up. The key, though, if you want to do it in a way that puts you in a better position over time, is you have to consider your full pricing leverage. Now, the concept of price elasticity is well ingrained in CPG. It's basically, hey, if I take my price up, can I quantify the volume loss that I'll get from there? But that's just one part of the equation. So if you see, for example, something where the elasticity shows a good trade-off, let's look at some other things as well. Does the product in question actually have good penetration growth? Or am I starting to see that the shopper base is actually condensing amongst higher buy rate shoppers? If that's the case, I might actually accelerate that trend. Even if I'm not uh, driving volume down, I'm putting myself in a bad position over time. The other item that we need to think about if you're a manufacturer, do the prices I recommend really get through to the shelf? Am I actually seeing that happen? See, if we're seeing them all across the board, then really it doesn't matter how I change my price. It's not going to happen on the shelf. Shoppers are going to see something completely different from what I intend. It may hurt my brand. So, so by that, can I, I just want to interrupt there, but by that, do you mean like the retailer would be um, doing something on their own that you didn't anticipate as manufacturer? Yes, in some ways. Oftentimes this happens because the retailer and the manufacturer see the value of the product as two very different things. Mm -hmm. And this is almost a vicious cycle that you can get into because when that value represents itself in different prices across the board, it's hard to peg what I'm truly worth to the end shopper because they don't see anything consistent. Right. Are you so can you give me an example? And would that be like in maybe a very crowded category or maybe even a category where the retailer has only a very limited assortment of options? Um, you know, strangely enough, one of the major causes of this is the manufacturer doesn't change price for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And when the retailers try to jump in to pretty much bridge the gap where they're trying to keep up with the true value of the market, they do so based upon their own shopper sets, their own usage occasions. In fact, some of the dynamics specific to their channel, like are we serving a consumer who's coming in to try to buy in bulk at a value or are we that little 
quick fill in type of trip. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes trying to keep your list price the same for a lengthy period can lead to you're not having any control over your end value proposition. Right. And, you know, I think that you even just spoke to it a little bit in that people are shopping for different reasons um, and they shop, their behavior is different. You know, going to a dollar store for just the quick hit, low price entry option versus a, a club store where they're buying in bulk for the bigger value. And Joan, that's probably a great segue into the other thing you need to consider in the short term period, which is how do you actually make sure your assortment is better tailored to the role those different channels will play? Because if you think about recessionary type of behaviors or wallet tightening type of behaviors, you see further polarization across the different channels. People will look more for that high value bulk purchase in a club store, people going to the dollar channel might be doing so because they're shopping paycheck to paycheck. They need an overall lower ring when they actually go to the register. Yeah. And the assortment needs to reflect that and it needs to be even stronger than it has in helping to serve that role for the channel. Yeah. And I think that that's also, you know, part of the value proposition um, that everyone should be looking at, that it's a, a way to keep your valuable shoppers because that's why they're coming in. You know, the types of products, the assortment that they're looking for when they do come in pricing aside. Um, if you, you know, you can't just keep raising prices. In fact, um, we've seen a lot of earnings calls um, being requoted in the media of how, you know, people are kind of maybe less judiciously raising prices. So then what happens? Perfect question. I think if you've gone through the steps of shoring up those existing gaps, you need to start looking at almost a different version of the four P's in some cases. There's your actual promotions that you're putting in the store. There's your actual positioning of the products, the pack architecture that you offer, and then longer term and more costly, fitting more on that two plus years of investment to get there is the actual pipeline for your innovation. And each of these are critical pieces of your to overall value proposition. But oftentimes when you see the current behaviors in the current macroeconomic environment, they almost fall to the wayside because we think that, okay, I need to do this immediately. And then you get the initial gain you stop be concerning yourself with the longer term. That's something that you can't deal with right now because it's going to put you in a really bad position if inflation continues at the clip that it appears to. Now, we'll talk a little bit about each of them, but I mean, I think you had already mentioned promotions. You know, I feel like the pandemic did us a disservice because Frankly, it interrupted a trend that we all needed to be aware of. If you looked at the past 10 years, there was a long running cycle where if you were a manufacturer or a retailer, you were spending more and more on merchandising every single year and getting less and less for it. Mm. Now, right now, hopefully that comes to light in much more glaring detail because Frankly, we can't continue to spend money that way. And part of the problem was we really created the environment where the retailer and the manufacturer were butting heads. They were looking at lift. They're looking at ROI. What's in it for me? Yeah. Problem is you have to look at it more in terms of the total profit pool I create from a trade event. Now, how that gets split up is a different conversation. But if an event is highly effective at creating a high profit pool, we should be doing more of those and figuring out how do we get our fair share, not just, hey, I want to do this event that is subpar, but I've negotiated a better way to get more of the overall profit that comes out of it. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes back to the same way many merchants get their 
you know, get their bonuses, you know, is in part of that trade dollars, that trade support. And frankly, that whole trade landscape has changed so dramatically with the with retailer media and things like that. There's so many more layers to it, digital. Um, but at the end of the day, Ray, consumers are looking for the deals, whether it's on their phone yeah, or wherever. So, so I guess, am I hearing you say, just be smarter about the investments? Um, don't, you know, you break the cycle, break the ugly cycle of whatever it was before and do what works best for all parties. In a sense, yes, because oftentimes what we're seeing is, hey, I've got last year's trade calendar. How do I make one or two little tweaks to it and put it through for this year? When, quite frankly, if we're going on lift, 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 and ROI, 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 try saying that three times fast like I did. It's not that hard. <laughs> very but, impressive. Uh, very impressive. <laughs> the problem becomes some of these events maybe they give us a good ROI and maybe we do them more and more and more. But think about that in relation to your everyday price points. Mm -hmm. If you're training shoppers to expect the same events year after year after year, why would they buy you when you're on your regular price at this point? They'll wait because they know the deal is coming. You need to shake things up every now and then to actually try to have a relevant everyday price and have one that doesn't just get eroded over time by constant promotions that, frankly, are just subsidizing existing sales and not bringing in new people. Right, right. I think I can look at bacon in August um, that, you know, because that's where we are right now. And all I think of is BLTs. And I'd be buying, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'd be buying bacon anyway. But I know that there's always big sales on bacon in August. So Exactly. Makes my BLT even more delicious. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've got the we've got the at least three P's, but we've gone through promotions. Let's talk a little bit about positioning. Yeah. Positioning, you know, this actually is my favorite tactic of them all because it's not very cost intensive, but it can have a huge impact on your end shopper and how they see your brand and your product. Think about it this way. We talked about how some of the first things that change during this type of period is you're not buying things out of the home as much. You're actually switching the purchases to in-store to save money. So let's say I'm selling coffee. People aren't buying their favorite coffee drink at a cafe. Well, they probably still want to be able to recreate that. Wouldn't it behoove me if I could work with my website, if I can work with my packaging, if I can work with some of my marketing to actually share these recipes to recreate those type of drinks? You can have tremendous savings on the part of the shopper, but now they have the path forward where they can actually have the same experience. And potentially you could do it even better because you provide some ideas on how you can customize or personalize the beverage. So it's even better than if you had it in the cafe and you're saving money at the same time. Now, I'd be willing to spend more for a brand that does that. I'm sure most people out there would be willing to make that trade off as well. You know, and I'm looking at our new product pace setters in both in 2020 and 2021. We had examples of exactly that by large brands like Starbucks creamers in 2020 and yep. Duncan, Duncan, um, you know, the multi-serve coffee in 2021. So you are spot on there. And I think part of it is, as you mentioned, it's calling out some of those um, unique experiential attributes, right? Um, you know, like I'll use Starbucks creamer as an example. It's the same flavors in a carafe style bottle, just like you would get in a cafe um, that you can enjoy at home for, again, pennies, well, much less than it would cost you to go into an actual store. Yeah. And some things that you'll find, frankly, we have all these different uh, features and benefits within the existing product set that we're just not taking credit for as well. I mean, Joan, do you typically buy frozen pizza? Yeah, for sure. So 
I'm sure that if I asked you, you could rattle off the name of about 10 different brands just off the top of your head. It's yeah. a pretty crowded space. Yeah. And one thing you'll notice is that the private label keeps getting bigger. It keeps getting uh, more variety. It's really making a presence and everybody is kind of chasing down how they can be the low price to actually get the shopper interested. The problem is that's just a race to the bottom. And right now that could be a disastrous situation. But think about it this way. Just a plain cheese pizza, a single serving. You know, you can probably meet the requirements for saying that the USDA as it officially recognizes is a good source of protein. We meet all the guidelines to say that. Most people probably would not know that, but very few brands actually are taking credit for that. And if you think about it, if you can highlight that, it's a way to break through the noise of everyone out there trying to give you these new flavors, this new stuffed crust or whatever is out there because no one's really saying it that much and no one really realizes that it's something that's inherent to the product. You're absolutely right. And we have been tracking, you know, some of those attributes that are gaining in both dollar share and in um, growth year over year. Like, for example, I'll use no low sugar. You know, it's diet. The word diet is out. Now it's no low sugar. Um, and oh, my goodness, it is exponentially it's blown up. But to your point with protein, another fantastic attribute that people are looking for um, that, you know, it is, it's like maybe review your portfolio, re review what you have and what the benefits are and see if some of those things that you're not promoting are what's really resonating with shoppers right now. Absolutely. That's a, that's almost like a freebie, Ray, right there. That's like a exactly <laughs> couple packaging changes. Use that real estate. Precisely. Right. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about that pack architecture, because this, I think, is absolutely, I think this is fantastic. This is um, really interesting. Yeah, you know, this is one where we talked about how you could use your existing assortment, and making sure it's in the right places. But this is how you can potentially think about capturing new occasions or better aligning to the existing purchase occasions with not changing the product, but just the configuration and the pack size and, frankly, how that allows you to hit the right price point you need to be at. So, for instance, think about this way. I'm buying maybe an energy drink. I buy, I drink it every day. If I'm buying it in bulk, do I want to have the same exact flavor every single day? Or maybe you know, a variety pack would be more appealing to me and add more value to me. And maybe I can even charge a little bit extra for having it in a variety pack as well. You know, I want to just, I want to interject there too, because of course, clearly I'm on new product pace setters mode still, but sure. that, that um, value pack, I mean, that um, variety pack is to me kind of a flip of how things used to be. Like we're now seeing um, in the hard seltzer space, especially Variety packs are leading a launch rather than kind yes. of being a two year strategy of like, well, let's see, you know, what flavors aren't selling as well that we can kind of put together. But it goes back to what you talked about earlier with that excitement, that experimentation, you know, that people are looking for the variety. So, it, yeah, so it is it's a much it's so much more relevant now, I think. Um, so that's a great point. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but that was a good one I had to throw in there. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, I'll give you one that uh, most people probably wouldn't think of. We've had brands of hot sauce, like red yeah. pepper sauce, come out. And their first launch to put a new brand out was in a three-pack of variety flavors. Interesting. Interesting. That's that to me, that would be a gift, a gift idea too. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. But I mean, years ago, you would have never thought about that applying to that category by any stretch of the imagination. No, but you know what? I think looking at the condiments in people's refrigerator, you know, such a nice 
anthropological experiment, but um, we do see so many more interesting flavors um, and hot sauce for sure is one of them um, that we ever, like we never had that growing up. It's not in middle America. Nope. Well, I think before we leave this topic, there's the other end of the spectrum as well here. I think um, we've probably seen it most in what you can call alternative burgers. So the non-beef versions. So fish, veggie, poultry, bison, or whatever it uh, may be. For the longest time, you'd always see them in a pack of four at the smallest end. And they normally have a premium attached to them. So you're spending more than you would for a basic beef burger in many occasions. Well, hang on. If I want to have people try this for the first time, and more importantly, I want to have a price point that they're willing to engage with to try it, why won't I consider a two-pack, even if that's at a premium per ounce, think one, the willingness to try it's going to be higher, but you also open an audience with shoppers who may be looking for that lower overall dollar ring as well. Or frankly, can I just say smaller households? You know, there are more smaller <laughs> households than there are large households. So um, before we get into innovation, which is super exciting, um, I kind of want to talk a little bit more on just um, pack size. And by this, I want to talk about shrinkflation, you know, where you've got either the same size package with less in it, or just simply a smaller pack overall. Um, and that to me, you know, that to me is, it seems like that gets the shopper's ire, um, if you will. So yes. <laughs> talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. And unfortunately, we found that shoppers can have very long memories when things are bad and you're requiring them to spend more to get less. So you have to be smarter about the trade-offs that you're actually going to give them when you think about this. So I think the one that I always like here is the example from hot dogs. Think about uh, there have been brands out there that have been in eight packs and six packs and five packs and seven packs, it's all across the board. And the size of the franc is always different, it seems. There was uh, one product out there that was in a six pack and it was a very large franc at the time. So it's like their colossal dog or something along those lines. Pretty modest sales, but the problem was that making that large size was also proving pretty costly. Now, could you have downsized the, the franc itself? Could you have cut one or two out of the package and maybe combine that with a moderate price raise? You could, but it was going to be pretty negative if you did anything of that, that. The question was, how could you actually increase the value to the end shopper while you do the same thing? And it almost sounds like a bit of an oxymoron when you say that, but the actual solution was you cut the ounce weight of the hot dog, but you actually upped the package count to a seven count instead of the six pack. You kept the price point very similar, but what people saw was, hey, I'm getting an extra serving out of this now. And when that new pack actually hit the market, it may have been at a much better margin and a lower overall ounce weight. But the growth that it saw compared to the other product that it was replacing was tremendous. It took off immediately because shoppers saw that they were getting a better value in terms of not just ounce weight, which is not the only thing people look at, but in what they were actually using it for. I gave my child a hot dog. I now have seven hot dogs to give them instead of six, generally speaking. What do you do with the extra bun? <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, I've, I've always wondered ever since I was a child why hot dogs would be in packs of uh, 10 and buns were in packs of 10. <laughs> so I think that's a little more longstanding. <laughs> yep. 
All right. So let's talk about innovation. And I think what I love about innovation is that it can be so much. I mean, I think here you're thinking of like, when you talk about an innovation pipeline, you're probably thinking of like new product development, but innovation can take so many forms. And actually this whole conversation in a way, even though it's inflation inspired, has been about innovation. So talk to us a little bit about some of that long-term innovation. Yeah. And I think it's great to look at what you can add to a product. Hey, look, my shoppers' values have changed. What do they need that I'm not providing today? What can I add to it? But you have to do it in a very smart fashion. The question is going to be, if I quantify how this changes their willingness to pay and how much they actually are willing to put out of their pocket for this new product, is the innovation actually worth it? Is it going to bring in more money than it costs me to make the change? And even more importantly, does it have a higher benefit when it's attached to my brand versus a competitor? Because if not, you're just setting yourself up for getting copied and then starting the race to the bottom all over again. I think the other problem is often that people get too focused on that side of things. What can I add? What can I add? What can I add? I think the other thing to note is that during boom times, we just tend to fall into the trap of over-engineering products. Mm -hmm. It's simply what happens. I mean, you know what? I can make this better. I can add more to it. I can help to differentiate myself this way. But when shoppers start cutting back, what they're actually willing to pay for, that window narrows. So the question is, what is there that I can actually look at that I'm putting in my product today that really isn't providing a value, but just providing me a cost. Mm. So I think one of the great examples here is if you've ever looked at bottles of juice, specifically children's juice, you'll find once again, a very crowded shelf, but you'll see the normal screw on caps. You'll see the normal, like, uh, They're called sport caps that you lift up and you can put back down so it seals again very easily. But that seems nice and all, but how much are you willing to pay for changing from that screw on cap to that sport cap? It's probably a lot less than 60 cents for a six pack because 60 cents was what it cost one manufacturer at one point. And when times got tough, they saw the product as overpriced. And so if you cut off that sport cap, put on back on the basic screw cap, you save the 60 cents, but it also allowed you to cut the price. In this case, you cut it down only 30 cents, but hey, that looks like a much better deal to the end shopper and we're making more margin now. Yeah, that's a fantastic one. So As we kind of wrap up, I'd like to kind of provide um, maybe a little bit more of an optimistic outlook. I mean, you you did start out by saying, you know, inflation, even recession, it's like this isn't all that bad. Um, When I look back at the big, the Great Recession, what I thought was interesting is that, yep, a lot of big companies sure did cut a lot of assortment, but that opened up um, a whole new wave of entrepreneurial or small companies that came in and filled in the gaps and really presented a lot of exceptional innovation. So if I'm kind of, I'm I'm turning to you and asking you with that inflationary lens, what is the silver lining um, that will come out of this? I'm glad you asked that because I wouldn't mind uh, anything I can do to make economics rid itself of the moniker of the dismal science, quite honestly. (laughs) But I think um, if you think about it, past two years, we've all been struggling with what is the new normal? What does the future of the shelf really look like at this point? Well, the good news is we're spurring many people on at this point to start to realign, not to, hey, what's available? What can we do? But we're aligning back against what do shoppers actually really value when they're pushed? 
And that allows for incredible opportunity to really strengthen your brand. The other nice thing to note is, hey, let's say things get fantastically better over the next quarter or the next two quarters and inflation just goes away entirely. Nothing that we're talking about here that would build long-term pricing leverage or that would strengthen that value equation, none of it would put you in a worse position. It would still put you in a significantly better position than you are today. So I would involve uh, everyone in thinking about this, not even just during this time, but more importantly, this is a continuous cycle you have to go down when you're thinking about your brand. And if this serves as the impetus to get you into that mindset, you're going to be so much better off in the long term. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, you've just inspired me, Ray. I'll invite you back to talk about deflation and how to how to <laughs> approach that. But for now, um, I want to thank you so much. And you've highlighted some really interesting things um, in terms of like you said, the three P's, I'll just stick with the three, three P's of like, you know, um, positioning, pricing, promotion, um, our, the pack architecture. Um, but I also want to encourage any listeners to go to our website and find your blog where you so clearly lay out um, what steps manufacturers and retailers should be taking right now to um, combat inflation and still be the chosen destination by their valued shoppers. So with that, Ray, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insight. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.